In this lecture, we will go through a five-step process that you can use to create your models. But let me first make a distinction that I think will help you in this process. We mentioned that a model is a simplified representation of a more complex reality. We use it because it helps convey an understanding that our students can use to independently explore further as well as to give themselves feedback. The result should be that they learn much more efficiently and quicker with the model than they would without it. So you can think of a model as the thing you explain and demonstrate to your students when you want them to understand something. It's primarily a cognitive process. From there you have exercises and concrete examples that you can use to help your students transfer that understanding into physical ability. Now, let's get started with step one of creating a model. We call step one introspection. In this first step, you want to figure out for what aspects of your dancing do you want to design a model. Try to dig into your mind and think about which part of your mental representation you want to verbalize for yourself and for your students. Here are some ideas that you can look for. Perhaps you have a desire to explore new ways of teaching some of your core values, or maybe you have been working on something for your own dancing that you wish to share with your students. Perhaps you were inspired by something you happened to say in class and you think it could be developed further, or something passed down to you by your mentor, or something that you discovered while researching the history of the dance. Another approach you can take that is perhaps a little bit of a simpler starting point is you can start thinking about the challenges you see when you watch your students dance. For example, it's very common for our students to struggle with closely related elements. Here are some examples from Lindy Hop. We have, for example, the single versus double turn, weak versus strong beat of the music, step versus triple step, stretch versus no stretch, single time versus double time movements, or mirroring versus call and response. As you can see, we try to do this not just for move-based elements of the dance, but also for our students' ability to understand the music, creative expressions, attitude, and the more abstract elements of the dance. Now, be careful in building models created from a desire to correct, to address things that you see on the dance floor and don't want your students to do. These desires can be a good source for inspiration, to see where we need a better model. However, there's a risk that creating models directly from this desire of correction will create rules that are only designed to counteract the problem and don't directly relate to our actual mental models. In turn, our students will develop an overly rigid and artificial mental model based on these rules. In other words, if you begin your process by thinking about which challenges you see your students facing, Make sure that as you continue this process, you also take a step back and look at these challenges within the bigger picture to make sure your model really reflects your mental representation of the dance and isn't fixing one problem by creating another. So once you figure out what you want to turn into a model, you can go to step two, which is strategizing. Here, you want to explore what strategies can help you transfer the understanding you have of a specific aspects of your dance. Here are strategies we use when teaching Lindy Hop. Now, Depending on what dance you teach, some of these you can take as is, some might inspire you to create your own. Either way, we think it will help you understand how we think about model creation. First, we can use strategies based on theories and guiding principles. Look for well-established ideas in dance pedagogy about how to execute typical movements such as spins or jumps. Or what theories are there about the music you dance to? Using well-established concepts from the music theory can also help you create powerful models. One we like to use a lot is the concept of strong versus the weak beat of the music and how swing music emphasizes the weak beat. We can also look for cross-disciplinary insights to help us find ways to explain the dance. One idea I like to use when exploring movements came to me via Christoph Razidlo, a fitness coach and a friend of mine. He pointed me towards the strength coach Michael Boyle's joint-by-joint -joint theory. In short, the theory emphasizes that joints alternate between their primary needs between stability and mobility as you go up and down the body. For example, the foot has the role of stability, the ankle of mobility, the knee of stability, and so on. Together with our students, we can now explore how it feels when dancing, for instance, by trying to think about stepping with strong feet to provide stability for the rest of the body. You can also go for guiding principles from other artistic domains, such as martial arts or improv theater. For example, improv theater's principle of Yes, and is a lovely mindset to take when improvising with a partner and lets you create a beautiful moment together. A guiding principle is like a set of rules that you can choose to apply to the dance. 
but you can also create your own concepts that works for you as a model to guide your own dancing. One example from our teaching is the concept of invitation-based leading. In short, the way Chris and I like to think about the lead and follow relationship between us is that a lead is an invitation, not a command. Meaning, the person who takes the lead for something presents this as an invitation that the person following in the moment can choose to accept, decline, or modify. By creating a concept like this, we can distill a complex set of decisions and emotions into an accessible, relatable model. Finally, as part of making your own concepts, you can also create your own slogans. There's something powerful about slogans that helps concepts stick deep into a person's memory. A slogan is like a catchy phrase that you can use to transfer a concept you have. For example, one that we sometimes use is manipulate the space, not your partner. We use this as our model for co-creating a partner dance. Rather than physically moving our partner, we focus on placing ourselves and shaping our bodies in such a way that it creates a clear invitation. But please note that this is something that you can take too far. There is a risk of appropriation when we label aspects of the dance to the point where there can be a shift of perceived ownership. Especially if you're an influential teacher who can reach a large audience, it doesn't take much to package an idea that already exists in the dance in a way that it seems to belong to you. It might be good for marketing and it might even be efficient for learning, but if you take this too far, you've appropriated something that belongs to the community and the heritage of the dance. Next, we want to describe a strategy that we use so much that we've dedicated an entire lesson to it in our teacher's training program. We call this method contrasting. The essence of it is that you select movements that differ at the point you wish to help your students improve. An example from Lindy Hop would be to help our students to become better at understanding the difference between a rock step that leads to a sugar push versus a rock step that leads to a push break. We might teach these two movements and then ask our students to dance both in various combinations. This brings up all sorts of details about what they need to understand within a rock step. Another way to contrast is to play with ranges or spectrums of movements. An example of this could be exploring step sizes, where we ask our students to dance using small, medium or large steps, or where the movement flows. Is it towards the leader or towards the follower or are they meeting in the middle? Or perhaps the spectrum can be the use of different energy levels. We like this approach a lot because it allows us to work on technique and physical ability without being too deterministic. It still leaves a lot of space for students to form their own preferences. The next type of strategy that we want to share is to use mantras. A mantra is in its essence a vehicle to help you concentrate on something specific. In the context of dance, a mantra can be a repetitive word, phrase, thought, or a sound that helps you focus on centering your attention on a particular aspect of your movement. For example, we can use a repetitive sound like a when we want to help our students develop a consistent and stable rhythmical base for our movements. We ask our students to keep singing this mantra over and over again and concentrate on matching the timing of their movements independent of what steps they take to fit their mantra. It serves as a reference that they can use to give themselves feedback and have something they can continuously adjust themselves against. Next, we want to introduce a series of strategies that are all about using our senses in different ways. We can use nonverbal communication or body language to form models. Here, we train our ability to watch for clues in the posture our partners go through while dancing. For example, a model that we sometimes use here is that we communicate clearly with our body language where we want to go. We show typical postures we go through when dancing the different movements and help our students recognize these postures. So, if you want to explore this approach to create a model to distinguish between two closely related movements, ask yourself, is there a subtle physical adaptation you make before you dance either one? And how can you demonstrate those to your students? Another powerful sense we tap into a lot is kinesthetic input. Here, we help our students know what to look for in terms of sensory input. For example, in our case, some times ago we had an insight we believe is very powerful when it comes to explaining a pull-push connection between two dancers. Because we want our dancing to be invitation-based, the way our partner can feel that we want to pull or push connection is to have a physical grip. This can be hand-to-hand -hand or hand-on-body that is comfortable but has enough friction 
that our hands don't slide when we move towards or away from each other. The friction results in the skin slightly moving in the direction of the connection we are communicating. A slight nuance on the same concept is to use props to help students understand what something should feel like, meaning what kinesthetic feedback are we looking for in our body. In Lindyhop, many people use an analogy of a rubber band to point out the stretchy feeling that we use in order to quickly communicate direction changes. If you've ever seen Lindy Hopper's dance, you'll notice that it can be extremely dynamic. Many teachers use the rubber band analogy to describe the way it can feel in the body as they go through these movements. So often a teacher brings a rubber band or asks students to imagine a rubber band that goes between the two dancers and asks the students to try to emulate that idea in their dancing. However, here, in my personal opinion and experience, I believe most teachers make a mistake when it comes to using this model. What I've seen many people to do is to ask the dancers to hold the rubber band, each on one end of the band, and dance using that. The mistake I believe they are making is that a stretch is a feeling that you have inside of your body, rather than something that is happening between two people. In other words, the rubber band has been put in the wrong place. I believe, if you really want to use an actual elastic band, instead of having each person holding one end, you should have each dancer hold the rubber band in one hand, and then attach the other side to their hip using a belt loop for example, then ask them to move in such a way that the stretch happens in the rubber band from this position. This will help them understand what's needed for a stretch to happen within their body. Once both partners understand this feeling using the elastic band, they have a much better chance to reproduce this without the props. A final category of strategies for creating models is very related to the sensory inputs mentioned just now. We're using a superpower humans have and that's the ability to just imagine something and feel it in the body. I don't know if there's an official term for this, but we can call it sensory imagination. One such strategy is to visualize a movement in our minds and try to emulate that with our body. For example, one idea that I sometimes use is to tell my students to shift their weights from one foot to the other like a swinging pendulum movement. This type of motion lets our partner better understand and anticipate our next movements making it easier for them to adapt and respond to it. Now, they can go through a series of different moves and sequences and see at any moment how to apply this pendulum idea and how they can use that to adjust their own movements. Another nuance of this strategy is to use our imagination to make the necessary physical adjustments in our body in order to create a specific effect. You probably heard and even use ideas such as move your hand as it flows through water or Play with the difference you would feel if you would dance through air, water, or something more viscous like honey. Okay, so this concludes step two, which is all about selecting strategies for creating models. Now, I'm sure that there are many more strategies or nuances of these, and it would be great if you share and let us know what you tend to use so that we can learn about even more strategies together. Now, let's move on to step three, which is all about exploring. Here, you want to take the model and strategies you have so far and start exploring the dance with these elements to see what is possible and just as importantly, what is not. What are the boundaries of the model you're creating? For example, you can explore to determine for what type of tempos of music does it work? In what context does it work? If you're teaching social dance, will it work with people who haven't learned from you? In what situations does it work? If you're teaching partner dance, will it work both in close and open position. After exploring the boundaries of your model, we can move on to step four, which is about controlling for values. It's very easy to fall in love with a model, but at the same time get blinded by its simplicity. Sometimes we forget to check if our models support and uphold our values or not. The model might be solving a problem that you've seen, but does it actually fit within the broader values you're trying to teach? If not, See how you can modify the model so that it's perfectly aligned with your values. Here are some examples. The first one is about the dance moves we teach. Sometimes when learning a model, we introduce drills or practice moves that helps our students develop a specific skill in their dancing. By practice moves, we mean something constructed, something partial that doesn't really feel like the dance itself to you, but you want to still use it because it still serves the purpose of practicing something particular. However, when doing so, we need to be extra watchful to see if these drills and made-up moves are also slipping into our students' mental representation 
not just like a scaffold to help them transfer a skill, but instead actually as part of the dance. In other words, if we start seeing students frequently choosing to do these drills and moves on the dance floor outside of the practice setting, you know that we've gone too far. Another example of how we need to control for our values is when we use stories to communicate ideas. Here, it is vital to be aware of how we might inadvertently perpetuating harmful stereotypes. Using imagery or storytelling that oversimplifies and misrepresents a culture can work against the values we aim to uphold. Now, I once heard of a Lindy Hop instructor who aimed to enhance the bouncing in their students' dance by using an image of an African village with a grandmother bouncing rhythmically as she's preparing food. This might seem innocent, especially to those unfamiliar with African culture, but a story like this risks reducing a rich spectrum of different cultures to a mere caricature, presenting Africans mainly as a simple or even primitive people leading cheerful lives. So, it's very important that the stories and images we choose not only resonates effectively with our students, but also respects the culture they reference to and align with our own broader values. As a side note on addressing these cultural and representational issues during class, we believe it is perfectly acceptable and frankly even commendable to bring up these topics. Sharing such insights can enrich the learning experience. For example, you might tell your students about your journey in searching for the right way of describing a model and explain why you chose not to use a particular one due to its potential negative implications. When doing this, be detailed, both in describing the model and explaining your reasonings for why you avoided it. It's important not to presume that your students possess the same background knowledge as you. Instead, offer them the full picture so they have the chance to further expand their own understanding. Finally, we are ready for step 5, which is about deciding how to communicate your model and how to break it down for your students. Now, we have several lessons dedicated to how to communicate different aspects of the dance to your students. But in short, think about what you want your starting point to be. We recommend that you allow the full richness of your model to be explored and understood over the course of a lesson or over the course of a longer program, rather than trying to hit every single important point up front and then just working on the implementation of it. So the question is, what's the first thing you can share that doesn't take more than one or two minutes to explain before you can let your students start exploring? Then, how can you help them discover the next aspect of that model and continue like that? Or is there any preparational work that you want to do before you even mention the model? In the contrasting strategy we mentioned earlier, sometimes it's helpful to just help your students be able to dance each movement at a certain level of proficiency before starting to explore the nuances that makes them different. Next, think about your own demonstration of the model. Can you show the model at different levels of complexity? By which I mean, can you demonstrate how you implement the model at your own current best ability? Then show it again, slightly simpler, but still perhaps far above the scale of your students. Then perhaps demonstrate it at the level you want your students to be able to do. And perhaps even go one step further and show the core, the essence of it, without any of the bells and whistles. While explaining it, you can demonstrate going up and down the difficulty level several times to help them to see the idea at each level of your time. These type of demonstrations can help a lot with both with inspiration and clarity. Meanwhile, always be clear with your students what level you expect from them, something we will talk a lot more about in Lecture 7. A bonus would be to, at some point, also show your own breaking points so that they can see that you are exploring your boundaries as well. Perhaps you might even take this one step further and show videos of people who've mastered that model beyond your level so that we can all have something to look forward towards. Finally, be aware that changing and adjusting your model can happen at any stage of your model making process, or indeed even later after you've already been teaching it to your students. Due to the curse of knowledge, which basically means that because we can't unknow what we know, we have a blind spot. and don't always know what it takes for our students to actually do the movements. Because of this, many of our models are not necessarily as effective and clear as we think they are. Sometimes, they can even be flat out wrong because we've been overlaying our thinking with so many aspects of our own mental representation without knowing it. So, when you teach your models to your students, we recommend that you present it as an idea you like to try, an experiment, or the best way you currently know how to explain it with the emphasis on currently. 
This is so that you can establish that you might change it or ask them to try different approaches that might even counter each other. This allows you and your students to stay open-minded towards the experience. Also, you hopefully will even experience moments in which you gain new insights and perspectives, whether it's from teaching the model or by learning something new that helps you come to the realization that your model should change in a significant way. All right, we hope you find this lecture valuable and that you start implementing this process and creating models for your own teaching. Actually, we want to take this opportunity to extend an invitation for you to email us at teacher-training at swingstep.com if you happen to have any questions that you want to ask. We are very happy to help. In the next couple of lessons, we will delve deeper into how to decide which of the models to teach when and in which order so that your students can form a strong mental representation of the dance that aligns well with yours. Now, we hope you're as excited to keep going as we are excited to keep sharing. So, I'll see you in the next lesson.